Today I want to talk about constipation. Because as a urogynecologist, I see a lot of women with this complaint, and I am for sure that it's a common complaint in gynecology clinic. In general, um, constipation is variable. Uh, what physicians may think of constipation versus what the patient thinks is constipation could be different things. But if you look up a definition, it will refer to infrequent bowel movements or difficulty with bowel movements. For me, I usually use a definition of less than three bowel movements per week. or hard straining with bowel movements. And when you think about constipation and treatment and evaluation, it's kind of helpful to remember a little bit of the neuroanatomy. So when we think about constipation, we're mostly thinking about the large bowel. As of all, all remember, there's an ascending colon, transverse, descending, sigmoid, and anorectum. The colorectal main job is to absorb water and some electrolytes. As far as when we're thinking about constipation and bowel movements, ascending colon is for storage of semi-solid matter. The sigmoid colon is more there for propulsion. And the anorectum, it's the anorectum here, that really controls defecation. If you really want to get technical about deciding on defecation, that's controlled by the rectal anal inhibitory reflex, with which the external sphincter of the anus squeezes and the internal relaxes and allows for sampling and a decision consciously made of whether it's an appropriate time to have a bowel movement. And if it's not, it just pushes the stool back up into the sigmoid descending colon for storage. Now, innervation to the colon is important. So there's sympathetic and parasympathetic innervation. So you remember the fight and flight. That's the autonomic nervous system. There is also a Extrinsic spinal accessory. Spinal accessory. This is more for detecting nauseous stimuli. And probably the most important is that you have to remember that the bow has its own nervous system set up called the enteric. Um, enteric motor control and this is the main component also important to all this is the pelvic floor so if you look straight on to the pelvis as we all know there's three main organs that sit in the pelvis the bladder and women the vagina in the rectum. And there's pelvic floor muscles that make up the levator ani, and the component of the levator ani that's most important to defecation is the pubic rectalis. Now this is what we can control to keep from passing gas or stool. So it's under conscious control. However, it can also have paradoxical squeezing when you're trying to have a bowel movement. So that could be an important cause of constipation that we'll talk about a little bit later. So when we think about constipation, we think about neuroanatomy, we think about dysfunction of the nervous system, the enteric motor system, um, the uh, reabsorption of water, the interplay between the sigmoid, the descending colon, and the anorectum, and the pelvic floor. Now, motility of the colon normally involves phasic contractions. 
and about five to six day, times a day we have high amplitude movements a lot of times reflexively initiated by eating on average the transit time through the large bowel is about 36 hours so today I want to review with you kind of what we consider idiopathic constipation okay you must remember that constipation can also be associated with irritable bowel syndrome, metabolic diseases, obviously neurogenic disorders, either in the central nervous system or peripheral nervous system, and different medications. Now, when I think about medications in constipation, I always think of the anti-medications. So here's a list of medications, starting with anti, that are associated with constipation. Antidepressants, antidiarrheals, anticholinergics, antihistamines, antihypertensives. I think we all realize that iron constipates, aluminum, especially aluminum and antacids, and narcotics. Now some warning signs with constipation. We're going to talk about idiopathic constipation. Some warning signs, obviously. Rectal bleeding or heme-positive stools. Obstructive symptoms. Recent onset, weight loss, or change in stool caliber. These need to make a practitioner think of colorectal cancer and referral for colonoscopy. Now back to idiopathic constipation. But I, how I really think about idiopathic com, uh, constipation is I try to think about the colon either having constipation with normal transit through it or constipation with slow transit uh, and potentially dysynergia of the pelvic floor, in other words, that puborectalis muscle not relaxing, or maybe outlet obstruction, such as a rectocele and patient needs for digitally splinting to have a bowel movement. I also ask them how often do they have a bowel movement, what's the stool consistency, and are they straining. You can always consider getting a colonic transit study and or anal manometry. Um, and the anal manometry really is a way of showing if there is relaxation or not of the um, pelvic floor with bowel movements. It also aids when we look at fecal incontinence, looking at the capacity and compliance of the rectum. So once I have a patient with constipation, I'm thinking, is this a transit time issue? Is this an outlet issue? Really the first thing I do for all patients is discuss education. So regardless of the cause, we're going to discuss education. And what am I talking to them about? Well, usually patients have already started laxatives. Now we're going to talk about using laxatives in a minute, but really what we try to do is get patients to become less laxative dependent. We discuss increasing the fiber in their diet um, and timing of bowel movements. Remember I discussed the reflexive increase in high amplitude contractions called the gastrocolic reflex after meals. So trying to time bowel movements after meals is another way of education. Almost all patients I do a trial of fiber. Um, fiber is safe. Recommended dose amount is 25 to 30 grams a day. Um, it doesn't really work great for slow transit colon won't really work at all, but it's really a no harm, no foul situation. And then I discussed with them trying to titrate fluid intake to have nice form bowel movements. So the second part is fiber. If it seems like the patient has a slow transit colon, in other words, they're having one bowel movement, two bowel movements a week, um, and fiber is not really working well, then I'll go ahead and start discussing adding laxatives. If I'm really confused, I can get a transit study. If it seems like the pelvic floor is causing dyssynergia, a lot of straining, they have daily bowel movements, even more than one time a day, but they're really straining with form stool, and on exam I pick up a lot of kind of pelvic floor tension, I could send them to biofeedback. Now here at our hospital we have excellent physical therapy for the pelvic floor and they do a really good job of teaching patients how to relax. Um, 
But if I'm confused, not sure, not getting results, if I want to check to see what really is going on, I can order that anal manometry. Um, and if I do all those things, check a transit study, anal manometry, trial of fiber, trial of laxatives, and I'm just not getting anywhere, I can actually order a defecography study, which is kind of um, putting paste in the rectum and having the patient expel it like they would if they defecated under fluoroscopy. So the first, third thing we'd add in is biofeedback. Now a lot of times I'm successful in getting patients better with just these three things and not ordering imaging at all. Um, so for those of you who've been in my office, you'll notice I try a lot of education, a lot of biofeedback with physical therapy, a lot of fiber, and kind of plus minus on the laxatives. So what are the types of laxatives? In general, there are st stimulant laxatives, there are osmotic laxatives, and then there's stool softeners. And what I was referring to as fiber uh, before can be considered a bulking laxative. Okay, so stimulant laxatives, probably the most common one it, that we use here would be Dolcolax. Uh, the way Dolcolax works is it alters electrolyte transport, increased gut activity. So you got to be careful because you can create low potassium, salt overload, and protein losing enteropathy. So that's the real reason we try not to keep these page, patients chronically on these medicines. Osmotic laxatives, um, my preference is I use a lot of Miralax, and they work by increasing water secretion. Now they can also cause electrolyte uh, abnormalities, so you gotta be careful on chronic use of these. Stool softeners seem to be a favor of the patients, but really the literature shows these to be less effective. And another thing to think of is just because the stool is softer, hygienically it can be more difficult to clean, if especially if it gets pasty or sticky. So what about se severe constipation? For severe constipation, we can try disimpaction, so digitally remove it. We can typically follow that with an enema in older patients, I prefer to use a warm water enema over um, sodium phosphate, but sodium phosphate would work. You just got to realize you can create more electrolyte abnormalities. So overall, for most patients with constipation, we can educate them on fiber and water, timing of bowel movements. If we need to, we can have some biofeedback taught to them so they can learn to relax their pelvic floor. We can easily do trials of fiber with or without laxatives, and in the majority of patients, we improve symptoms and don't need to order expensive testing or do any more surgery. So for the most part, I don't really look at rectus seal repairs um, or colectomies as being necessary to treat constipation unless they're severe and refractory to everything that's conservative. Thank you.